<laughs> I'll bring it up. Are we ready, Dave? All right. Well, not, uh, this way, sorry. Oops. Yep. This is up. Hello and welcome to another episode of Grange TV. We have with us Mr. David Roberts, TAFE extraordinaire, uh, Robert Whittaker, UFC fighter and all-round good bloke. <laughs> Um, Anthony Seabold, the uh, head coach of um, the Brisbane Broncos, and Paul Devlin, the head of is it performance. Yep. Yeah, head of performance at uh, Brisbane Broncos as well. Um, just here to have a chat. Thank you for coming, guys. Really, really appreciate it. We're, we're, sorry, we're up here for about a week, spending about four or five days doing some professional development, um, looking around at what they're doing, and um, it's just yeah, amazing, amazing facilities amazing coaching staff uh, and all the other staff have been great to us it's been so far it's been an amazing experience so thank you guys for oh, having it's us it's our pleasure to, to host uh, both you guys or all three of you guys um what's so you guys transitioned together from from the rabbitos yeah yeah what's uh what's that like well for, for me um paul was a real key um you know when you work with someone for a long period of time, you build trust and co connection and cohesion. And, um, you know, I worked uh, firstly with Paul down in, at the Melbourne Storm in 2014. And um, although we didn't know each other b before that experience, um, you know, we, we worked really effectively together, I thought. So I was always hopeful I'd get an opportunity to work with Paul again. And then at the Bunnies, um, that sort of occurred. And, um, you know, Paul was the head of performance down there with myself last year and, uh, you know, I just knew that um, when the, the transition came, um, you know, Paul was sort of integral to, to um, you know, what I wanted to do and implement up here because he's got a really good understanding of what, uh, I suppose, firstly, I'm about as a coach and, and secondly, what uh, the program looks like. How important is that for the cohesion between the two of you? Oh, for, for me, it's um, it's the missing piece, really, in my role, you know. it's It's not often that you get head coaches who who fundamentally understand the science behind why we do what we do and, and you can have some really good conversations with with Anthony around uh, the science behind uh, how we do it practically and and it's difficult to understand that because there's a lot to the technical side of coaching that these guys are absolute experts in and it's a lot then to ask and expect a, a head coach to understand the science as well so but for me having Anthony genuinely understand that it, it saves time as well it makes us more efficient and productive i think as a as a football staff so um yeah like anthony said number one is is the, the trust element is hugely important and then after that for me it's have, having a head coach who can challenge me because he understands what i'm talking about rather than kind of just blind trust if that makes sense yeah so what's what's the interaction occur like how, how does it how does it look in a in a from a coaching capacity like what what goes on so does it who reports to who what what's said what, what yeah so so essentially um with regards to our planning which is something that you guys are probably interested in it starts with our game model so it, it literally starts with how we want the team to play um, our football so there's no point starting from the the performance side of things you know we need to um, you know, from a coaching point of view, have a really clear understanding of of what we want our football to look like, and um, and you know how we implement implement that with the team. So uh, that's sort of our starting point. We talk about having a game model, and it's built around pressure and efforts, and um, you know that's sort of where uh, Paul comes in because we we do have an integrated approach to how we prepare the players. So um, you know, in the past, probably when I came through as a as a as a player. Um, teams very much would prepare in solo, so you would do you know the gym side of things over here, and it wouldn't really have too much of a transfer to you know what you did from a technical or tactical point of view, or even from a mental point of view. Um, the way that I work as a coach is having a, an integrated approach. So it starts with our game model, and then um, if you look at those four key areas of you know the, of the physical prep, the technical, the tactical, and and the mental side of things, that's where sort of Paul comes into play, and um, I, I use his expertise and. Um, you know, we, we, I suppose, you know, bounce ideas off each other, but that's essentially where it starts from our game model. Okay, and then you fit in doing... Yeah, I think the, the realisation and the <coughs> expectation here is that the head coach, a bit like a CEO in a business, sets the strategy, and that's the game model, and everything comes back to that game model. So I see very much my role in that is in, in um, finding ways to allow us to be better at performing that game model that the head coach wants. And, and that means that we need to, um, we like a quantified approach, so we, we like to be able to measure progress and track progress so that we can show that we've got improvements. And, and really, 
it's fundamental that the game model's in place because that's what allows us to to plan and strategize from there. If, if you don't have a very clear expectation on what what the processes look like to deliver the end result, it's hard to be able to track and trace improvement and, and progress along that. Yeah. What's your impression, Rob, been of the of the everything in the last week that we've been here? Yeah, it's just um, I get I guess my uh, when I, when I first came in and, and I was on the field yesterday and w- watching the boys move around, it's just I was, I was I really was impressed. I was very like very very impressed. The uh, the attitude and I guess the the aura, the atmosphere of the team itself and the, and the boys on the field was just so positive. Everyone was working hard, but there was no egos. No one was trying to put on each other. Like they were there to work and enjoy it. And um, I guess secondly from that, it's just the professionalism of the team was you know un- like, re- remarkable. You guys, all the boys did what they needed to do. They didn't muck around. Then they moved on to the next session, then the next session. And uh, you know, all, the, all the meanwhile, they're enjoying it. You know, they're having a good time. But uh, when, when, it, when it came to work, they got to work. And they were, everything was done properly. All the coaches were doing the, the job. Like every every gear and cog in the, in the machine was just doing what it's supposed to do. And it was, it was great to see, it really was. What, what do you a- attribute that to, Rob? Like when when you see it from an outside perspective, what do you attribute that to? Like how, how do you how did that come how does that come about and how does that you know maybe defer to other places that you worked in? I think I think having like a having like a, a coaching staff that uh, that trusts each other is, is is huge for for the the overall like working mechanisms of of, of a team because um, every coach and every 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 person needs to have trust and confidence that they, that they, that the other part of the wheel is, is going to be doing what they need to do, and um, all, all all your guys, all the coaches out there on the field, everyone there is here for the same purpose, which is the model you're talking about. Like, they all know the purpose, and they're just doing what they're supposed to be doing. You know, no more, no less. Just just what they're supposed to do, and um, and, and yeah, you know, you can just see. You can, you can just see the, the the results like they they are looking good. What well, uh, I, I kind of agree with Rob as well. Like well, that's something that uh, hit me straight away when when I when I came when we came in, and I was looking around at how you guys because uh, you know when when you we come up here for professional development and sometimes you know people are like like what when you spoke to Paul or you spoke to Anthony, what did you get for about their you know, tactical periodization or whatever. But for for me, uh, it's more like I was speaking to Anthony yesterday during the, the wrestling session. It's um, more like I saw a lot of intangibles. Like, obviously, you, you guys are very, very competent in what you do. But I saw that when you come in here, there wasn't... And it could be wrong. Like, I, you know, there might you know, might be slowly putting arsenic in someone's food. I don't know. But <laughs> when, when I came here, I saw that um, there was a cohesion with the coaching staff and there wasn't... They didn't appear to be like, because uh, sometimes you feel it as an outsider. You feel it straight away, like, yeah, oh, these two don't get along. You yeah. know, um, it, it, it's it's interesting you say that because um, in in all the different environments I've worked in over, um, you know, over my coaching career, and I suppose even when I worked as a teacher or, or as a lecturer, um, you know, there is um, opportunities for. Um, the staff to be a little bit disconnected because everyone's got different opinions, you know, about how you should prepare or how you should play your football. And the little, I suppose, I'm um, saying I have, and um, it's something that I know the All Blacks have used in the past. Um, certainly when I went over to the NBA, um, you know, some of the teams there spoke about it, but it's it's called disagree and commit. So, um, you know, co- coaches or, or the assistant coaches or the strength and conditioning staff or the recruitment um, staff, etc. There might be some some differences of opinion about how we do things, but the big thing is um, give your opinion, and that's that's great. You know, we, we want people to, to give their opinion and, and speak up, but when we walk out of the the, the meeting room, um, you, you need to commit to what you know the head coach um, has decided. So that's the thing um, that. Um, I've seen high-performing or effective um, you know, teams have, um, particularly across their staff, is that, yeah, they'll disagree, of course you do, um, but you're then committed to you know, what we need to get out of that session or out of that particular block of, of preparation. And uh, that's something that we've been working on really hard here, and, and that's one of the things that I see with the staff here. Certainly, you know, we disagree about certain things at, at different times, but then we commit to what our next job is. Um, Paul? There's something that, yeah, I'd, I'd add to that is... Um something Anthony does really well is role clarity because 
um, with the game model approach, everybody knows how that how that how their role specifically applies and, and assists us in the performance of, of that. As an example, a, a strength coach understands and, and accepts that improving a player's squat is great, but how does that transfer to improvement in performance? And and that's really clear here. I, I think when I mean, you look look at it, really in in all teams, everybody wants to feel like they're contributing. And you can only do that when you've got real clarity around your role and you know how your part in that cog allows the wheel to, to roll, you know? And it's, I think the role clarity is something that's often done poorly um, because it can be tricky to do. It can be tricky to get into detail about what someone's specific role is and how they're helping the team. But once you've got that clarity, it allows you to, to commit to it fully and feel a sense of, of belonging in, in a team, you know? What's that thing, um, what's it called? The, the Dunning-Kruger effect, you know, you only know what you know and you don't know what you don't know and yeah. you have no, like, cognitive thing of not knowing it. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, I work at TAFE with, with Dave and worked at TAFE for, like, 15 years and we have brilliant teachers, good managers, but you also have people become institutionalised and then sometimes they're in charge of something, but they, like, they might have been, they might have got there because they've been there for a while or whatever, you know, and or, or big companies, TAFE is a big company, Broncos big company yeah. and uh, if you're trying to push a narrative of something but you're not you don't know like you might not have um, the skills to be able to you might be a head coach but you're trying to do his job too yeah. you know and and that that jumps out massively sometimes and I don't I don't see that here and it, it, I take it that's not the case in in other clubs that that hasn't been the case. Yeah, no, certainly I've seen you know some of the really good clubs that I've worked at. You know, Melbourne Storm and, and South Sydney Rabbitohs come to mind. Um, yeah, there's a real growth mindset to uh, to getting better. You know, so um, you know one of the things that the, the coaches um, at both those clubs and also what I see here at the, at the Broncos um, are both the, across both the um, you know the actual um, technical tactical coaching staff but also the performance staff is they want to get better so you know doing professional development you know literally what what you guys are doing here coming to a different sport um, you know it's a team sport but seeing how we prepare and what our coaches do and how the players do their thing um, you know that's really important um, so we sort of um, provide opportunities for the for the, the staff to do professional development we um, you know, actually have some staff present to the rest of the staff so some of our performance staff they'll present to all the staff including the coaching staff because um, you know I want the assistant coaches to have a better understanding of why we do what we do on the field with regards to our preparation you know why you know why we have Alex come in and, and, and do the sessions that we do with, with Alex away from here why um, you know Ryan Whitley who's an outstanding strength and conditioning coach um, you know runs these strength programs down there, you know. So I spoke before about that integrated approach. You know, everyone needs to have a good understanding and a clear understanding of what the game model looks like, but I think it's really important. And the very good clubs I've worked at um, across the board, you know, they have a growth mindset, but also th they they need to develop an understanding of, of what, you know, we do from a performance point of view or the performance staff, um, you know, have an understanding of why we coach like we coach. You guys have been here for three months, you are saying before. Yeah. Um, and we're talking about the honeymoon period being, you know, usually what, two, three, four weeks maximum. So we've passed the honeymoon stage. Yep. Um, and how's that coming along now? Yeah, so it's interesting you talk about that. And I, and I can't remember if we spoke about it the last time, um, you know, we actually sat down and, and, and did a podcast. Um, but um, when I went to Harvard, I did a really interesting course. It was a leadership course and it was... Um, called um, Building Effective Teams. And it obviously it was catered for the, the corporate world, but there's so many transferable things from it's sport to organizational corporate. Organizational psychology. Ex exactly. Yeah. You know, so, but, but the thing they spoke about there, and, and I've used in my coaching last year and also here, is you, you talk about it, the honeymoon period. Well, they talk about um, that there's, there's six stages to building a, a, you know, a really effective team. And the first stage is um, the forming stage. So that's normally the two or three weeks. And you know what? The guys who are a little bit lazier or, or aren't great from a punctual point of view, they'll turn up on time and they'll work a little bit harder because there's a new staff on board, you know, or there's new players in the group. So the first two or three weeks, the forming stage is the honeymoon period. Think of it like that. But after a couple of weeks, what do people do? whether they're coaching staff, performance staff, players, they, revert back to themselves. they go back to their normal yeah. behaviour. So, you know, you have that sort of forming stage and you go back to the norming stage. So that's when you, you get a really good um, idea of who a person is because I won't say it's a fake two weeks, but it's like a, 
um, everyone's sort of sussing everyone out a little bit. And, um, you know, then people go back to their normal behaviours. So, you know, after they go back to their normal behaviours, if you're going to be a highly performing team, you have to go through some sort of storming phase. And that's what I said before, you know, there, there is disagreements at times in, in meetings. Of course there is, you know, because we want to debate why we do what we do. How can we be better? So there's always going to be debate in and around that space, but there's going to be storming and might even be storming from a you know, player's point of view. You know, you challenge the players to get better in this area or you challenge the player to get better in that area. So, you know, that's, you, you have to go through that storming phase. But, you know, it's the forming stage. Then you see some normalising of behaviours. Then, you know, you have that sort of tricky period where you've got to challenge some guys or you might pick them up on their behaviours or you've got to make some tough decisions, whether it's moving staff on or, or pushing players into different positions or they, you drop them down the depth, depth chart or whatever. But to get to that... Um, performing stage, you, you've got to go through you know, those first three stages. So, yeah, we've gone through the forming stage. Um, we've certainly sort of seen the norm, normalising of behaviours and we're probably going through a bit of a storming phase at the moment. You know, we've had trial periods. You know, some of the, some of the stuff in our game models worked really effectively. Some we need to sharpen up on and, and the same, you know, from a staff point of view. So it's interesting that you sort of talk about that because that's sort of essentially what I've put a lot of research into, you know, by going over to Harvard there and doing that course and, and uh, you know, I suppose um, you know, do, doing a lot of um, you know homework and reading in and around that <coughs> space. Is, sorry, no, no, please. Is it is it hard for you to identify some of the problems, like as you were you were saying in the stages, like through the storming phase, to identify and 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 see some you know potential problems that could occur before the season starts? Yeah, yeah it is hard, especially in like a fresh team. Yeah, it is, Rob, um, because. Um, you know, when you're on the, the training paddock, um, you know, you're going against, you know, essentially your first grade side is training against your reserve grade side. So, um, you know, you can sort of, you, know, you can certainly see some things that you need to fix up. But until you get out there against NRL opposition, I'd imagine it's the same for you, Rob. You know what I mean? Until you get out there and you're, and you're in the battle against, um, you know, a, 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 an NRL team um, who's also had a very good preseason and had a great preparation and got good coaching staff, that's when you sort of can see, okay, well, right, we've got this part of our game model. Um, we're heading in the right direction there, but this is our area for growth. So, you know, we had a really good um, opportunity to have a look at that against the Titans on the weekend. We were a little bit scratchy early, but I think um, certainly, you know, some of the above game speed training that we do here at training certainly helped us as the game wore on. But it's, it's not until you're in the furnace, so to speak, you know, that, that you can really sort of ID you know, some areas that we need to be better with. And that's going to be the process, mate. You know, we go down the Melbourne round one who have been an outstanding team for a long period of time. Yeah. So they'll, they'll work out really quickly any deficiencies in our game. But we've got to go through that process. You know, we're, we're a team that um, has just, you know, has just, you know, formed not long ago. And, um, you yeah, know, we're going through that, that stage now. Well, I have a question for the three of you on, on this. And I guess you all come from different perspectives. Um, you have you have transient players in the NRL, like someone that might have been a couple of years in one team, a couple of years in another, one year in another team, and then he's here for sh a short contract <coughs> or maybe a year. Yep. And Rob, you see this, of course, in fighting where guys jump from camps to camps to camps. And you've always been someone that's been with your coaches for the most part, where uh, there's been a little bit of jumping but back in the day. So you've done kind of all of it. But you've been always you, you was you were always with your coaches for, for for even before us you were with Henry for a long time. Um, do you want to just talk about that, like just to get that congruency between transient players, trans and and you from having experience of being around coaches that don't necessarily know you that well, and I don't know, I kind of find it interesting you guys as coaches dealing with guys that you don't have for three or four years. You've only had, the guy just comes in. Can they come in mid-season? Yeah, they can before a, a, a certain date. They can, yeah. Well, dealing with that and then person coming in and you also, when you have to deal with coaches, when you've had to deal with coaches, maybe that um, you hadn't been with for a long time and, and new teammates and that what, what that was like. And I don't know, anyone, Paul, maybe? Yeah, I think it's um, to feel part of a team it's again it's feeling like you're contributing but from the personal side we put a lot into relationships and uh, and getting to know each other and you can't rush that process you know it takes a bit of time and um, we have specific groups that that we spend a lot of time in away from football like, do you want to touch on that Anthony brought in around uh, yeah yeah just uh, um, they're, they're just groups that um, you know five or six players and a, and a coaching staff um, member attached to that group that 
um, you know, meet up once a week away from footy. And um, in the groups, they're from a really experienced player down to a very new player, like a 17 or 18 year old kid who's straight out of school. Um, if you think about um, what do they have in common, you know, what, what's what's Darius, who, who's our captain, he's won premierships at multiple clubs, he's played for Australia, etc. What's he have in common with an 18 year old kid? Like Darius is married, got got a, uh, a young daughter, 17 or 18 year old kid straight out of school and um, mm-hmm. probably, you know, learning to, you know, learning to, to, to understand himself even a little bit better. Us. Yeah, you know. Um, so what have they got in common? And um, and so we spend a bit of time invested in that space because I think that's really important. Yeah, and once they've got that and once they 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 know each other on a bit of a deeper level, you just find there's a different level of commitment when it comes to training as well. It's a lot easier to then pick a player up on something he is or he isn't doing. Um, and then again, going back to I know, going on about the game model, but once you've got specific processes in place that we believe deliver improved performance, you can hold people to account to that as well. And then again, I just think everyone wants to belong to something. And by having those processes in place, we, we know what we're holding people accountable to and that, and that stays rock solid. It doesn't change week to week depending on depending on results. One of the things I see, like, um, you know, we do like a quantifiable approach. Like I see yeah. that, you know, like kind of like in, not necessarily a TAFE, but wherever, but you see that in um, people that they don't, it goes back to the thing, they don't know what they don't know. So they've got a checklist of, um, and I'm, I'm all for quantifying training and that, don't get me wrong, but they go to this checklist, like a HR model, where it's like, I asked you if you're a good, you know, do we get along, Paul? Paul said yes. Cool. Um, do we, do you like movies? Yeah, you know, and then you look on this checklist and you go, look, he and I are mates, and you're like, nah, man. Like you're, exactly what you said is like you can't rush that process. Yeah. And you put someone into a a team or something that doesn't that doesn't fit in. There's no they're not cohesive with the rest of the team or for whatever reason. And you're trying to push that process and go, look, you've got eight things in common. You should get along, and you, and you can't. And I and and I. I I'm a um, big believer in that, in relationships and relationship building and letting that um, take its time. You can't just rush that. So, sorry, Ru. No, I, I, I guess like um, from, from, from my own perspective, it's very, very similar. It's uh, like you, you, you join a coach or, or a coaching staff and you have your team and what draws you together the, at first is, is kind of, it's something, it's organic. It's uh, you, you agree with each other, your attitudes are similar. And then you start working together and you see some results. And then as time goes by, like whether you, like if you picked a, a kid up that was young, he's still developing, you know? So like from, from a lot of teams, from the teams that I've been working with and, 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 and training with since I, I started my career, it was, it was, it was, it was like that. We, I was young and I was growing and organically, you have to grow together as, as the team goes on. Like everyone has to grow, not just you. Like everyone in the team has to grow, and then as 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 years go by, and and you start to train, you start to change, and you either you have grown together, or you find that down the track you don't see eye to eye anymore. And That's um, it. But I suppose any relationship, hey, like you know, people get divorced, you just grow in different yeah. different areas. Sorry, go on. Yeah, it, it, it's exactly like that, and it's like uh, you find that down the track, you guys just aren't the same people you were when you. Was, started working together and um i guess that's one of the hardest things i think it's just i, I can't imagine like in a, in a football sense like you guys are getting players that are brought in that you've never met that have had this amount of tenure with this coach or things were done differently like that i, I can't imagine how hard it would be what's a find, squad yeah, 35 40 personality um like so so yeah it's, it's it's essentially 36 so you have 30 players um who um, what you'd call in your NRL squad, and then you have um, six what we call developmentless players, like like rook, rookie type players, you know. So thirty six, that's a lot of players, you know. Only seventeen or eighteen suit up on a weekend, that's and a, um, yeah, that's a lot of personalities. Yeah, yeah. yeah, you think too, you've got you've got selection too, so you you, you can have guys here at any team who <coughs> who are really close friends off the field, and they're competing for the same shirt, and and it could go two or three weeks in a row, they got to shake the guy by the hand who's playing in their position, and he's still a friend. I think that that comes back to um, one, it being a, a process-driven approach, but but also the honesty and transparency around around that fr- from the top becomes really important because that's how those relationships are maintained. And because at the end of the day, for the team to do well, there needs to be that competition in training. And if you lose that competition in training, the team suffers. 
you know so it's honesty and transparency is really important there the average we're talking about the average lifespan of a rugby league player is about three years so yeah i think it's like uh, it's about uh, 45, 42, 42 45, to yeah. 44 games and how cognizant are they of that fact I, I think there's still a lot of education to be put in place in and around that fact i think a lot of young guys who are essentially on the rookie list or the development list like i spoke about before they're 18 year 18, 19 year old kids, you know, essentially straight out of school. And in rugby league, um, they, um, you know, you have to pay those kids um, 60 grand. So pretty much straight out of school, that, that's what you play or, or any player on, on the development list. That's that's what you must pay them. I think the minimum wage for a 30 man squad um, player is, um, I think it starts at 70 and then the top 25 have to be 82 grand and, and above. Um, so, so um, it is a lot of money for a for, you know, 18 year old kid, 60 grand, you know, straight out of school. It's not a lot of money for some other people in, in, in the workforce, but that, that is a lot of money. Now, their opportunity to earn more money, obviously, um, you know, if they perform the average NRL salary, from my understanding, is about 340 grand. Um, but obviously, you've got some really high yeah. earners and you've got the, the, you know, the minimum wage earners. But I think some kids think that, A, the career is going to last forever. And and B um, that so they do get up to earning you know that sort of money that you know the average NRL salary or higher that they're always going to earn that money so um, education <coughs> in and around that space of you know investing your money wisely um, you're not always going to be earning that amount of money because most most young men um, as I said before have a really short career if you're lucky enough to have a ten year career you, you still end up the other side of your career and for for the high percentage of players they go from earning you know really high wages you know let's talk about six or seven hundred grand to where do they go to next unless they've invested really wisely you know so there's a lot of education around that space and i think nrl do it better than or far far better than 20 years ago when i was playing um and you know we've got a particularly great um you know welfare and education staff here but that education um, process is ongoing because you get young players in your group every year but they think the career is going to last for a very long time so um invincible. yeah well oh, you can imagine you know there'd be um you know a lot of athletes in, in whatever sport who probably feel or have felt like that you know and i think we were talking about the nfl players yesterday isn't it there's a, a heap of research yeah. is it it's crazy the percentage yeah. like they end up broken they, yeah. they, end, they get paid I don't know. Yeah, extraordinary. Amount. <laughs> yeah, extraordinary <laughs> amounts of money. Yeah, so it, it's an education process. It's an ongoing process. I don't think the young kids really appreciate that it goes like that. But if we, you earn a dollar and you spend two, you're going to go broke. Uh, yeah. In, regardless of the um, of the sum, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, it's interesting. I, um, I'm not sure if you guys uh, would remember. Uh, he, was a, he was a legendary AFL player called Jonathan Brown. And he played his whole career here at the Brisbane Lions. And um, when I was at the Melbourne Storm, um, our head coach, Craig Bellamy, got him to come in and speak the night before a game. It was actually up here against Brisbane. So it's about 2014 or 15. And a couple of things, a take, couple of takeaways I got from, from Jonathan Brown was, was this. Um, one, your career goes like that. You know, so when his first three or four years, Brisbane Lions made four AFL grand finals in a row, won three of them. So he said he was thinking, how good is this? Like, not easy, but I'm going to win another... Yeah, he, you know, and I, and I don't think he played another final series for the rest of his career. So his first four years, he he was in grand finals, then then didn't play in a final series, um, and then he spoke to we had you know some 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 players at the back end of the career, and, and so the message was you need to appreciate um, you know every game and every season because it goes like that. And the second was to the senior players, the end is closer than you think, you know. So give absolutely everything, don't leave anything in the tank because the end's going to come like that. And um, that was some real takeaway messages. And I know that, you know, probably hit some of our younger guys in the squad at that, that particular time right between the eyes because, um, you know, it's hard work to make the finals every single year. And as young people, you know, if you get immediate success, sometimes you think it's just going to happen, it's going to happen. So, you know, whether it's individually or collectively, you know, the team isn't as good or, you, you know, your work ethic isn't as high or whatever else. But there's some really key messages in and around that space. And um, it goes like that. It, it honestly goes like that. So, um you know, that's an education process for, for our game and, and, and I suppose all young athletes across a variety of sports. One of the interesting things I find as well is the guys who, um, w whether it's through guidance from, from the staff here at the club or uh, different clubs that I've worked at, the guys who've got a commitment to doing something away from the game, and there are many more now, like, like Anthony said, than certainly when I was playing, it, it wasn't even mentioned. 
you know, 15 years ago, no, no one mentioned Paul's career really, or certainly helped you set anything up. And you were earning less then, eh? Oh, wet, yeah, significantly yeah. less, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I find that the guys, and generally, uh, a high percentage of the guys who have got another um, education, whether it's education or training in, in whatever, for, for the post-football career, tend to find it easier to engage at work, at training. I think it just gives them a, a way to compartmentalise what they're doing and it gives them a distraction, but a welcome distraction away away from the field. So I know at times, obviously, we push them to the point of exhaustion at training. That's that's what we do, especially during those pre-season periods. But when education is structured the right way, I, I actually really strongly believe it helps. It helps them concentrate better at work because they're, they're, they're practising that when they're away and they've got something else, a complete release. You know, when they're young and they haven't got kids especially, because when you've got kids, you get given a distraction. It's yeah. there for you. So yeah, you absolutely. Get home. But, but when they're young and they're in that stage where, you know, whether they have or they haven't got a partner and they've got a lot more time on their hands, allocating some of that time to something so far removed from elite sport. In a lot of our guys are doing a um, cert for in personal training, which has some transferability, actually. I'm always a keen driver of, of players doing that because they're learning about health. But some of the others are doing business courses. And that helps them, you know, part of the business is how do you manage finances? And that has a transference onto how do they manage their own money? So we ran that program. That That's yeah. when we first, with the Cert yeah. 4 for, uh, TAFE, we ran yeah. it with you guys. Yeah, yeah, the yeah. Bonus, yeah. yeah. Certainly the, the personal training side and the, I'm not sure how many of them end up becoming personal trainers, but it, it It's almost not important, them. but yeah. It, it's it, not exactly. important. It's a distraction yeah. and it's something that educates them on fundamentally uh, how why do we do the training we do it gives them a much more rounded um, education on nutrition on how to train another person which then allows you to train yourself in a better way maybe, maybe, how, how much do you think also that like just taking them out of like the the, the, the spotlight of, of, of the game and away from what their skill sets and a lot of these guys like can do to um a, a, and just making them realize that there's more to the world. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> it's, it's, like, an, it's enormous. Some of them would have just been, they would have been yeah. the best player yeah. in the team since they were five years old. Yeah, yeah. In, their, in their little town or yeah. Yeah. big city. No, it's enormous, Rob. Uh, the, the, the big difference from when I first played footy as a young guy um, in the lower grades here at the Broncos until now, is, is, there's a couple of things. So, so we still get the best young kids from the regional areas and they've been the big fish yeah. in a small pond, so <laughs> yeah. to speak. And I'm sure you would have seen it in, you know, in Sydney growing up too, Rob. Um, you know, there's the, um, you know, um, schools that have sort of rugby league programs or um, yeah. sporting excellence programs attached to their schools. So even in some ways, even though it's Sydney and it's 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 a bigger environment, they're still the big fish in a small pond at that oh, rugby 100%. league um, and the school of excellence. Reflect that. And the attitudes at times reflect that. There's no doubt about that. So I think um, what I said before about you know um, you know the eight, you think about the eighties and the nineties when I first came here to Brisbane. Um, even guys like Alan Langer and Kevin Wilders and Glenn Lazarus, all those you know uh, legends of, of the the time here, they all had jobs. So whether they were sales reps or or um, you know working um, you know in their own business or whatever else, they all had that distraction that Paul spoke about. But also you've got to deal with people, don't you? You know what I mean. So if you're a sales rep, you've got to try and sell a product to, to Fab now. Fab's not going to care if I'm the you know the the best <laughs> halfback in, in footy or whatever. He just wants the product that he's going to pay for. So. You've got to build re relationships and develop those relationships and, and provide a service and provide a pro product or, or whatever it was that the guys used to do. But um, that sort of changed from about 1997 when Rugby League went full-time. You know, So it's been full-time now for what's 21, 22 seasons. So the big difference is in those days, um, they worked as chippies, as teachers, as whatever else, and you had to, you had to get on. With, with, yeah. There's a big bad world out there. That's why I love going overseas at the end of the year. Like... You know, at times rugby league, particularly in New South Wales and Queensland, you're under the spotlight and it's a circus. And you know, particularly as a head coach or a, or a leading player, you know, you you you're under the microscope a bit. But when you go over to no America cares. or whatever, no one cares. And it's, you get, you know, I loved going to Harvard that time. I, it was so great because no one was there talking about footy or anything. You know, they're talking about you know businesses and no baseball. And they didn't. <laughs> I had to, to name drop Russell Crowe a couple of times. You know what I mean? So, um, but but yeah, that's that's the the good thing. And I'd encourage the players to travel. I encourage the players to to do some further education or traineeship or apprenticeships or, or whatever it is. But I think it's a, a fantastic distraction. 
because uh, because that was one of the the biggest things for my own personal development development and personal growth that that really helped me you know um approach like my training and, and how i did things outside of the, the octagon and how i did things off the mats differently was just that was just realizing i'm I, i'm just good at one particular thing there are guys out there that have zero idea nor do they really care yeah. <laughs> like you know in yeah. their eyes i'm a savage i'm a barbarian yeah. you know um and it's it's just that it's like a it's like a it's like a like a cold water you know like it's just a it's a root it's not a root shock it's, but it's a it's an eye opener and, uh, <laughs> have you have you found that like you know your profile particularly probably since i first met you which was the end of 2016 when madge and myself come and rolled around with you for for an hour or so <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that was a great experience but like your profile is just you know you were you were i remember being world ranked then but you know your your profile now across the world because ufc is a massive sport like how, how does that have an impact on on what you do um i suppose day to day and it's it's, and it's funny eh because like australia is definitely the, my, my biggest market like australia new zealand like this 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 region so like this my biggest market so where all i think a lot of my fans come from but um and i was thinking about this the other day because like i said I, i've been thinking about how the world is much bigger than, than just you know throwing hands yeah and um i think it was like a few months ago i had to go to hospital for some reason and I was sitting in the waiting room like everyone else, and I was sitting there, and I was out out near Camden where I live now, which is out in Camden, kind of kind of on the outskirts of Sydney, almost rural, and a lot of like those sort of characters don't really watch the UFC. Yeah, they don't, they don't care. And um, I'm just sitting in the waiting room, <laughs> huge light, and and I was just like, it just, I was just like, no one cares. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. And it's like, and I shouldn't care either. Yeah. Because, you know, you just that's just how it's so. Yeah, you know, I, I think. A lot of a lot of guys, a lot of high profile athletes, they get sucked into that because of how everyone treats them. Yeah. And it's it's I think the trick is like not to let that affect you. You know, you're you're not doing anything really special here. You know, you're not, you're not solving any of the world's problems. C can I just ask one question, Fab, to Rob about, you know, preparation? Like so, you know, when you go to the States for a for a big fight, um so it's interesting, you know, we're going down to Melbourne Storm, so we're going down to <coughs> to you know enemy territory we're only down there for a short period of time you know so we'll do the bulk of our preparation here we go down there um you know when you go across there obviously because of the the the, the time difference etc you'd awful yeah you'd, you'd go early and you have a preparation there H how does um going over there preparing for a big fight um what distractions do you uh, need to be aware of all fab and alex and, and the rest of the staff need to be aware of and and what what have you um, experience that that works, you know, leading into a big fight away, particularly away from, uh, you know, away from home. Do, do we start? You, you answer. Yeah. Um, I, th I think the first first thing is that um, like, like like yourselves, we quantify everything, we record everything, and every time we go on a trip or we go away for a fight preparation, everything's written down. Everything's written down, like how I felt, you know, how my weight fluctuated, because you normally I'm trying to make weight as well, so I have to watch that going up and down. How what I ate on the flight, you know, what I did the day before, how I, like, um, how the jet lag affected me, how my sleeping was, the sessions that I did, like, we write it all down so that next time we have to do something like this, we know straight off the bat, okay, you need a day off beforehand because you're not going to sleep that night because you get on an early flight that morning and you can't sleep on the planes and the jet lag's going to hit you for three days. It's like everything has to be done yeah. so that we know, so that like I'm not worrying about oh my weight's up three kilos because of the flight. And I start to freak out about that because it's, I don't know why. When Once it's written down, I, I can see, okay, my weight did this last time. It'll go back down in the next two days and we're good. And uh, that in itself, uh, being able to see it gives me a lot of confidence in, in, the, in the program, yep. uh, you know, and what we do. But um, I, guess, I guess a big thing is we, we keep things simple. We, we keep things the same. The, the work should be done by then. Like and everyone knows their, their role, like what you guys were talking yeah. about before, like, like the the guy that does all our like sports science stuff is Justin Lang. Yeah, from I met Justin. Oh, you met, you met, yeah, yeah. yeah he, he's like the guy that does all our stuff with that. So, um, and then you know Alex, myself, and Justin were kind of. This is a funny thing. Is like, up until the fight, close to the fight, I'm, I, I usually travel early with Rob, and just look after all that that stuff. We make sure we got a gym to train at somewhere where you know usually we know someone in the area usually when we fight in vegas um we train at sergio Pena's, um who's like a 
jujitsu guru, but just like he's a friend, you know, yeah. and that like having familiar faces and a gym that you can go and train in and just, you know, just having that is, uh, man, like you, like you say, enemy territory. It's like, it's exactly that. Like having people around you that, that care for you and they're your friends and that that's, that's massive. Um, so we have all of that stuff planned. Um, and then everyone knows their roles. Like, so I'll travel early and then as it gets closer to the fight, Alex and Justin Fitzgerald start to take over. And then fight night, like I'm in the corner as well, but um, generally Alex is the, the we, we don't have a head coach yeah, in, in our yeah. system. So yeah. we've got like, I'd say Justin, um, Alex and I have the same level of responsibility. Um, it works, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't suggest having three coaches for you know for other people worked for us um no no one has more say than, than any of us but there are things like i usually organize rob's schedule and I, and that's how i liaise with justin lang justin fitzgerald um charlie bishwadi who's his muay thai coach at the moment like i liaise with all of them and make sure we can get the schedule going yeah, okay. and then also liaise with rob's manager so i don't i'm not necessarily then I, I i do do some technical coaching but primarily it's the other the other two that, that do that yeah and, and charlie so then um when we get over there we try and replicate that and try and get onto that thing as, as as soon as possible and we have it already written down we know which days you know how how much hours we need per day you know for to get used to the jet lag but it's um it's hard eh? well, yeah all i love about what you're saying there is um you, you take out opinion and, and then when you take out opinion you also do your best to avoid confirmational bias because it's, yeah. it, it's so prevalent is um a bit like goes week to week competition everyone has an opinion and i suppose it's probably magnified even more for you because your fights so many a year everyone has an opinion on on result and performance and all the rest of it and by by your approach of tracking and tracing everything that gives you um the ability to, to avoid opinion and, and base it on evidence and fact and yeah. avoiding confirmation or bias is, is just so important. And keeping it small, keeping, I think what Rob said, keeping it small, keeping it simple for us is, and for you guys probably even harder being how much spotlight during the season you guys have. Like for us, we keep it small and simple. And like, so if, if that's my role, that's my role. Like I might, Alex and I might talk about something, but then like, I live and die by that decision. Yeah. And Alex will live yeah. and die by it. It's by the that same decision. my situation. Yeah. Yeah. And dis disagree and, and commit yeah. is like it it's big as well. Yeah. Like I, I might say to him, look, I don't No, I, I don't even think I say because there, there's a thing where I've capitulated that that is your role, do you get what I mean? Um I might say, nah, I don't I don't think that that's a good idea or whatever. But I'm not going to go say to up, you know, behind no, that's, Alex's that's back. That's the thing about, about disagreeing and committing. You know, yeah. Alex doesn't know. He's, no, what's he that, doing? That, and that's no. the thing. So if you, in my experiences, when I worked in really positive uh, environments, that's the thing that happens. There's a, you know, you disagree behind closed doors, but then you're committed in front of the playing group. So the players would not have any idea that there's been, you know, debate and, and you know, like, you know, conver you know c conversations had behind closed doors. And you have to have that for growth. Otherwise, you're just two scarecrows. You know what I mean? Like, oh, you want to do this? Yeah, I agree. You know, and like yeah. sometimes you don't. No, agree. you have to. Like, you have to challenge yeah. each other. Like, you know, I challenge Debs. Debs will challenge me. You know, I'll challenge the assistant coaches. They'll challenge me. It's 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 not about not challenging, as, as you said, but it's about once the decision's made, then we're, we're committed. The other thing I suppose about that, you know, you spoke before about um, that. That's you know, role clarity, etc. One thing I learned. Um, from from my time under Craig Bellamy at the Melbourne Storm was just how effective delegation is. So obviously you, you have to trust the person, and you know when you when you give someone responsibility, you can make them accountable to to, to that responsibility. And Bellyache I thought was was great for me when I reflect back on what I learned, you know, over the different coaches I worked for, it, just the way that he delegated and tr and put trust in people, but also um, he he gave you that responsibility, but he certainly made you accountable to 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 your role, you know. So as an assistant coach, everyone had different roles, and you know, um, and the same on the performance staff, and and we've tried to replicate, you know, make no bones about that. I've tried to replicate that that delegation, you know, this is your area that you're responsible for, but then I make that that coach um, accountable for that responsibility, so to speak. It's the same with the the, the senior players. You know, the more responsibilities I can give the leaders in, in the team, the more I can make them accountable. And then when I give them responsibility, you empower them, don't you? So when you empower somebody, they 
that, you know, they, they, they take that on board. So, um, yeah, delegation and, and then, you know, that role clarity is something that, that was outstanding with Frank Panisi and Craig Bellamy. Craig, um, Frank was the general manager down there at Melbourne and obviously Craig the head coach and something I really took away from that environment. It's one of the biggest things I've seen in, in teams, like seeing a lot of being on the outside from a lot of MMA teams. Cause like with, especially with, with MMA, like there's a lot of different teams mm. and the teams could be on three people squads or they could be whole gyms. And um, just you, you see that all the time where they, they have they have like a, a head coach and then they have other other coaches that uh, uh, they, they coach different fields or different skill sets. But the head coach still wants to be telling everyone what to do. Like he wants to kind of he wants to be the head coach and he, he'll ask you to go teach jujitsu. But then. He kind of wants to teach jujitsu as well. Yeah, I know what you're saying. Whereas, yeah, like yeah. the the trust needs to go both ways, yeah. sort of. Like he needs to trust the the jujitsu coach needs to trust you to make the the calls, but you need to trust them to do their job. Yeah, and that role clarity is so important for like the you know, as you guys are saying for the just just for the team to keep working organically and to to, to work successfully. Yeah, but you see that you see that not like in in companies you see that in business people simply don't have that skill. They don't. They don't understand that. That that's how strong of a skill that is. You know, like to to be able to to delegate appropriately and to uh, to have accountability and trust in people. But then people don't even spend time developing trust. You know what I mean? With with people. My um, it's funny. I was just talking with, with a friend of mine this morning, and um, she she just got made redundant, and the. Uh, the person, the like, the first conversation that they've ever had with the with the HR person was when they got made redundant. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, and then like they never spoke to a person. Then they said, "Oh, you've been working here for X amount of years. I'm making you redundant." And then this friend of mine was like, "Ah, whatever. You know, it's all good." She saw it coming, you know. And then the HR person never spoken to her and just said, "Look, think uh, sends her this email like a uh, this like cold HR email kind of thing saying." Um, Hi, I hope you took it well. Can we have? Uh, can I organise a farewell lunch for you? And the person that I know was like, "How about you running an oncoming traffic?" You know, yeah. like, <laughs> you, you've never, you've never even developed. You know, and this is this is someone that that's in HR that you would imagine has been, like, you know, has formal education, has had some level of training, um, has been in the role for a long time, but they they've done. They've ticked all the boxes, but they, they they just don't have that skill. Like you, it's impossible for me if I thought that I, I would potentially have to fire you or you that I would leave our first conversation for that day after we've been working f- together for five years. Like, yeah, you would. You know, people don't. It's interesting that, isn't it? Like because I think in a in a job where you compete every week, and it, like I say, everybody has their opinion. There's lots of tough conversations. Because performance goes up and down, you know, and so um, I, I think in our area, probably with the Im- people immediate to us, we have lots of tough conversations on a regular basis. Uh, but again, I, I've got people in, in business friends who tell similar stories to the one you're talking about there, where it, it can be a little bit different in bigger departments, and you know, you've got more more people within your business who you maybe don't get to speak to as as often, and maintaining those relationships, I think, is it's interesting dynamic, isn't it? Because when it comes to having a tough conversation there, how do you deal with that? Yeah, man. And then also the big thing I think with that as well, though, even from your own perspective, though, if you're that person, you'd want to have relationships anyways because people are loyal to people, not to the organization. Yeah. Yeah. So if the first time, like, if I have to fire you, I have to fire you, or you have to fire me, I have to fire you. I'm fucked. Fire him twice. I fired him anyways. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Uh, uh, no, but you know, if we have to, whatever, it has to happen. But um, like that, the network doesn't have to be severed. If yeah. if I handled it correctly, you know, like I can, I know that maybe down the track we can work together, etc. Da 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 da. And um, again, people don't really value that, and I, that's one of the big things I noticed here when I came. Because there's a like a I don't want I don't know if the word is loyalty, but let's let's use it for for lack of a better word, um, where you're loyal to the person, not necessarily to the organisation, um, and a lot of people don't understand that that difference where they're like, well, I'm I'm I don't know I'm middle management at 
I don't know, whatever company, Mount Franklin Water, and I'm going to be middle management, Mount Franklin guy forever. And you're like, dude, you're only Mount Franklin yeah. middle management at Mount Franklin, nowhere else. Um, and that's a big thing that I noticed is like you guys are working well together and you were working well together at Souths and now you're working well together at Broncos and you'll have, I don't, I'm not trying to get you fired, but if you move <laughs> to another thing and you want to, and you want to, and it happens organically, you'll work well together there because the, the thing is not based off the fact that your position and the team, the thing's based off the, re, the interpersonal relationship. Yeah. And a lot of people don't, you're saying that and people are like, whoa, yeah, whatever, you know, but uh, I think that's massive and it's massively evident here. Um, actually, Dave, you, David has got a microphone, but um, I don't know, what do you have to say based on that? Because you, you work in, in, a, in a managerial role, you know, oh, I yeah. think I'll give you the microphone. Uh, um, I, I don't know, just from first impressions, because I don't know, we first spoke at South. Yeah. Um, I think you were, what, like pre-season? Yeah, really <laughs> new into the job, yeah. Re really new into yeah. the job. And then after that conversation, South just started winning and you, I think you became the coach of the year and all that sort of stuff. But it was interesting having that conversation because you outline, outlined the plan and how you actually changed an organisation culture. How do you actually then implement it on the field? You talked about tactics. Um, how important for you and coming here to the Broncos, the first thing we noticed is that um, you took us to breakfast and it was the whole organisation. It was the players and the admin staff. They were all eating together. Like what? does that do so, sorry can I say that? As well? it, um, it was done oh, no, sorry. Yeah. on on what David just said that was done very organically as well because yeah. you know I've been to you know there's business breakfast and that and nobody wants to be there everyone's like <laughs> you know like <laughs> I've been to some bad yeah. ones man no one wants to be there like everyone's like all right I'll, I'll pretend to to like it but that and I've been to enough of them to to know, you know, which ones are, are good and which ones aren't. And this one was good. Like, well, yeah. yeah. So, so, so Dave, just to, to answer sort of, you know, your um, question and around why we do that. Um, so, so there's a lot of research, um, again, from the business world uh, coming out of the States in and around discretionary effort. So discretionary effort is something that is hard to measure. You know, we talk about, you know, being able to measure things, but discretionary effort, you know, that 5 to 10% that, um, is a little bit grey or a little bit subjective. Now, the research out of the States, um, and I'll use these two simple examples, um, suggested this. If you've got a boss, for instance, who, um, let's just say, you know, on a Friday afternoon, um, you know, you, the office normally closes at five o'clock. On a Friday afternoon, though, he shuts the office at three and puts on a couple of beers and a, and a, a barbecue or a couple of beers and a and you know an afternoon sort of snack for the staff um, before they leave for the day so you think about that, that boss there think about a boss then who on the friday afternoon if they work monday to friday sorry monday to friday and every other day is five o'clock but friday's no different and they work all the way through to five o'clock and there's no thank yous or goodbyes at the end of the week think about how that person walks away so the the discretionary effort comes on this if if you as a as a boss or as a manager um at times um you know show that um, you care for the staff and that you value what the staff does during the week, then they're more likely to stay back until six o'clock on a Tuesday night to get the job done that they need to get done for Wednesday rather than say, well, it's five o'clock and I'm out of here and I'll worry about picking up that job, you know, on Wednesday morning. So, so if I relate that back to a football club, um, if we're going to be successful, if we're going to uh, going to improve as an organisation or as a team, um, it's not just the 17 players who run out on the weekend, it's not just me as the head coach. Um, it's the head of performance, it's all the performance staff, it's the um, recruitment staff, it's the um, you know, assistant coaches and just as importantly it's the upstairs you know, where we are here today. It's, it's the people in membership, it's the people in corporate, it's the people who um, you know, do all those little things that don't go noticed and don't necessarily affect the scoreboard as such but uh, for us as an organisation to continue to improve, we, we need the discretionary effort from all the other staff. But, but they do affect the scoreboard because when you... Well, they do. When you go they're, they're somewhere... In they're intangibles. Yeah, man. When the, you yeah. go somewhere and the, everything, like the shareholders don't like the team and there's problems with them and then there's this, this and that, you feel it, man. Like you, you really, really yeah. feel it. You know, it's a Richard, who's the guy who owns Virgin? Virgin? Yeah, Richard Branson. Richard, Richard yeah. Branson, he goes, treat people, um, train them like they want to leave, but treat them so they want to stay. Yeah. And that is like, 
yeah. like spot on. You yeah, know, yeah. So, that, so that's the reason. Yeah, and it's not just doing it because the research says yes, you've got to do it to get discretionary effort. It's because I, I really see value in it. You've got to care. Though. Um, you've, you've got, got to genuinely care. care. Yeah, you know. So, so I, I really see value in it. And as I said, um, you know, for the preseason, we used to do like the trainer of the week awards and do a couple of things in front of the staff just so that the staff up here get to know some of the players. But but now that we're sort of in playing mode, we just want it to to be. You know, a catch up. You know, you informally, you know, line up, grab your your bacon egg, um, you know, wraps, and you go and sit down. And you know, there might be a two two players, uh, an assistant coach, and one of the you know the, the media department sitting around the table eating their their brekkie. Um, f- for me, that just you know brings everyone together. You know, we don't want an us versus them. We don't want an upstairs versus downstairs or downstairs versus upstairs situations. That's very prevalent, though. Yeah. It can happen. It know. can happen. It's, it's also routines and rituals so important. You know, you talked earlier about the HR person not not speaking to that. Per- it avoids that situation. You know, if you're sat upstairs in, in the office here and you would be interested in a player or a certain staff member and having a conversation with them, you get a weekly opportunity to do that. And vice versa, you know, if uh, players downstairs do a lot of promotional activities and, and membership, they maybe don't speak to membership department much. If they want to find out something or if they want to get to know someone in a certain area or of different areas of business, it can all help each other. Uh, it gives them that opportunity weekly through the routine and ritual yeah. of the organization. And that that's, uh, I think, another thing is like, and, and you know, you have your, your like ebb and flow, like your peaks and you like valleys and your peaks and your training and your communication and whatnot but that's the other thing is like as soon as you fall out of the routine like it's it's real evident if you have one you know yeah. what i mean it's real like you know yeah. boom like it's 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 not there yeah. and then when when especially when we travel just trying to hit that routine and get back on that routine well, you s- that that's the thing that it took away from you know um you fab and, and rob talking before about you know when you go to the states or whatever in this routine to what you do isn't it you know what i mean so it's 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 quite similar for us you know routines are really big in in um in what we do and if we want to be consistent we need to have consistent routines it's 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 um what paul i guess this questions for you as well uh, not not for you as well in particular for you without you know naming teams or whatever but how big is the gap between a scientific and professional approach um one using science two using a professional approach as far as like a managed people management perspective how far apart is are some in our real teams it's hard to say without being in each club um i've been at four different nrl clubs but lucky enough to be in a role where i'm kind of managing that science department in three of them um i will say i touched on confirmation or bias before it's it's very easy to do what you've always done. And, and it's also very easy to correlate, well, we did that and we won, so that must work. That's why I talked about confirmational bias and the ability to, I call them tripwires, to, to look back at something and read the extreme opposite of what you believe in to try and see, well, do I truly understand it? And then also through um, kind of intra-department presentations, can you distill your knowledge and explain a certain approach in such a simple way that someone who doesn't understand it whatsoever can get it and understand why you do it. Because if you can't, you probably don't understand it well enough. I think when it comes to science, there's 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 an, a real opportunity to be able to to um, do the same things over and over and not really review and digest whether it's affecting performance directly or not. Because I, I was going to say this, like in you know, in economy, they say lies, dirty lies, and statistics. Yeah. And like you can have statistics mean. Like, yeah, you can. Yeah, 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 yeah. The direction that you want to tell the story, and you can get stats to show that or tell that story. Well, you certainly can do that in the sports science world, and, yeah. and the the way. The so that's why you need that critical thinking and that lateral thinking. Uh, absolutely. So a bit like Rob and yourself talked about earlier, we we try to track everything that we think is 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 worth digesting and and reviewing, but then we look at things like sports science, GPS metrics, and um, you know, there's there's millions of things. There's a force plate analysis, there's every weight they lift, there's what they eat, what the hydration is, what the body weight is, all, all those things. They're like, if you imagine the speed dials on a car. So when you're driving your car and, and your speed increases, if you're constantly looking at the speed dial, you're gonna crash eventually. But we also know that looking at the open road is good, but checking your speed also provides a, you know, a good background to make better decisions with your driving. And that's the way sports science is for me. It's really important 
we need it there. You wouldn't want to be driving your car without a speedo in this country anyway. Yeah, just <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it should be that. It should be something that you refer to that allows you to ask better questions. I think the problem that arises in that again, I can't use specific examples in the NRL, but in, in wider sports teams in different countries that I've visited is when the problems tend to arise when someone thinks that they've got the answer. This is the answer, this is the only way of doing it. Or when they use data from sports science to make a decision without truly looking at whether they're applying confirmation or bias and actually they've just convinced themselves in it. You know, science, the whole point of science is that we constantly challenge and question what we know. That's the whole emphasis on it. And, and um, you know, a good example is, is recovery. You know, 10 years ago, ice baths were recovery. That was number one because it, 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 when you think about it in your head, it makes sense, doesn't the it? The constriction vasodilation it makes, yeah, makes exactly, sense. Exactly, yeah. it makes sense, right? 100%. But then as, as knowledge around heart rate variability has come in and the autonomic nervous system and rest and digest versus fight and flight mode in the autonomic nervous system, the research is start well, not starting to, is suggesting completely that ice baths work if you believe they work. But if you don't, then it puts you into a fight or flight mode, which is the quintessential opposite of recovery and resting yeah, digestion. You, like <laughs> because you're tense. And, yeah. and I've watched this empirically as as a younger coach thinking, this, this doesn't really make sense to me. And I've enforced it earlier on in my career where I'm thinking, no, no, ice baths work. I've read the research, but I was using confirmational bias. And if I didn't, you know, review that and, and if, if science and research didn't advance us in that area, we wouldn't be where we are now where we know that, yeah, that it, it works. If you believe it works, absolutely. But if you acutely don't believe it works, it's probably not helping you. It, it's funny you, you say that because <laughs> because I, ice baths have always been like the, the go-to thing for recovery. But I feel like I'm gonna die when I'm inside one. Like, <laughs> oh, I can't do them. <laughs> no, like, I can't. Like, if like if there's a cloud covers the sun, I wear a jacket. You know what I mean? And but, so, if, no, no way. Yeah, I, I used to. Like, I, I've jumped in there, and as as I've sitting there dying, I'm pretty sure, like, li no, literally dying. <laughs> I'm thinking to myself, this can't be good for me. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what? I'm freaking out right now. Well, that's what Dev's just talking about. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and it it. it it is, again, back to the simplicity you touched on earlier, Fab, is sometimes things can be too simple and we want to overcomplicate them because it seems too simple. So fundamentally, f for me, and uh, my philosophy around recovery is rehydration, which, which is pretty simple, nutrition, getting the right food in at the right time, and sleep, which th there's just mountains of research yeah. over a long period of time that those three things cannot be challenged as far as recovery. If you don't get those three right, you cannot recover. Is it, is it, there, there was a thing that like, in, in relation to that, and uh, I don't want to just plug one little thing out and paraphrase it, but they were saying like, I don't know who was it. I think I was talking to Justin Lang who we was talking about this stuff and talking to his dad, John Lang. Yeah. John, yeah. yeah. And he's saying like, fundamentally for people that do the things correctly, eat properly, sleep properly, um, and uh, rehydrate properly, like when you look at it, if you tore your hemi and it took four to six weeks, like not you know not allowing for some other thing, but like if you tore tear your hemi, you're not coming back. Be, you know if everything's you're doing right, it's around that time, that four to six week period, and um, you know you're saying it's simple and blah 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 blah. But people try and do like I, I see it like when we go like you know when we go to the UFC and that they're using like every every gadget everything they can yeah. they look like like they're going and you know yeah. out of space and then after the fight or maybe not even after the fight but i see him like drinking alcohol yeah. and yeah. blah 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 and i'm thinking what what is the point what why is the ice bath that important when you just drink well, like i'm sure you would have seen you know uh, sometimes they have like cameras in change rooms or whatever or a try you know like uh, after after games you know I've, I've been in dressing rooms where it's compulsory to have an ice bath, but while the players are in the ice bath, they're having a beer. You know what I mean? So it's, you know, why, why do the ice bath, you know what I mean, if, 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 if that's the sort of approach. And there's, certainly there's a time and place in our sport to, to have a beer and, and, you know, enjoy each other's company. There's no doubt about that. But I always found that a little bit um, strange. You know, like it's compulsory to have ice baths, but then there's no food provided or there's no, you know, um, you know water provided to the players. Yeah. 
um, and then here's a beer on your way out to to the team bus, you know. So, but people do want to overcomplicate, and that, that's is what we're saying. Like people want to make it; they don't want it to be as simple as yeah. because the thing is, we we're talking about this with guys training, like because constantly, you know, people might might say, "Oh, to you know, they'll tr- come train with Rob or, or whatever," and da da da. And it's not it's not easy what he does, what Izzy does, what um, Jacob does, David. Um, it's not easy, you know. And like you can, anyone can train one day, you know. But it's and if you ask what they do at training, it's not anything amazing. It's just like the the sessions. But then you've got to hit every session, and you've got to hit every session every day of every time we train. And then that becomes the least bo- the the most boring part is you got to go home eat properly, drink properly, sleep at the right time, and then come back and do it again the yeah. next day. It's it's not sexy, man. That's why no. habits. <laughs> no, you talked about not. habits. You talked about habits before. There's um, there's a great book called The Power of Habit. And, and when you read it, it's um, it's one of those books where you read and you, you kind of laugh to yourself. You think, oh, my God, that's me. And it, you know, one of the uh, early parts of the book, it says, um, think about what you do from the minute you wake up in the morning. And it says you go through your routine and things you do and, Simple things like you pick up your toothbrush and you, I'll bet you go to the same section of your mouth and brush the same teeth first every time. Yeah. Why, why do we do that? We do that because when you perform the same action repeatedly, it becomes autonomic and, and you don't even think about it and the brain does that to conserve energy. And it's the same when you, I talked about routines and rituals before when, you, when you're trying to develop footballers uh, and, and from my area, trying to develop them away from the field. The biggest part, especially around nutrition and, and then again with sleep is trying to establish rituals. So how, how can we get the players to do the same thing repeatedly and it be the right thing? And so, yeah, I think that's why it becomes um, overcomplicated generally is because people look at that as, as too simple. And when the habit yeah. loop breaks, it talks about that in the book about habit loops and, and how you break a bad habit and we, how you we always, a good one. We always talk about that, like when um, we have to weigh up, when you have to do like appearances or anything. And I always say to them like, it takes you away from your training. You have to give like a monetary value to each session and then work out how much these people are going to pay you for you to be there because it breaks that routine loop, mm-hmm. you know, and it's hard to get back on that routine loop. I think um, I was something I was going to say. Oh, fuck, it doesn't matter. I'll give you an example. Sorry, so yeah. An example of that is consistency. Um, it, we talk about it over and over, like the... the I often say, uh, I'm not sure you can prevent injury in rugby league, but you can limit the damage when they get hurt. You know, you're probably not going to be able to prevent a fracture at some point happening to certain, to a player in a game yeah. rugby league because they're 120 kilo monsters sport. Yeah. trying to bash each other. Um, and really, the the strongest research at the moment around how you prevent that is is consistency of load, is consistency of you know we still down load it's really it's it's training and content of training which comes back to the, the tactical periodization model and everybody knowing exactly what the roles are allows you to deliver the same content you know yes slight changes around shapes and plays whatever, but the same content with the same loads from gps metrics consistently and, and finding that 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 i imagine it's the same in the fight game that, that any changes in that load and tim gabbard's done some great Fucking research yeah. around that changes in that load are then you, be, you go into risky territory and that comes back to the fundamentals of, of human beings being adaptation animals we, we adapt to whatever yeah, the demands that it's place spikes isn't it that that put the player at, absolutely player at risk in our sport yeah. they're doing research in all sorts of sports now it started in team sports because it was nice and easy with gps but they're doing it in every sport now like yeah we monitor the load and the effort yeah. and and that's that that's the thing like when it's good to have in this conversation because like when when sometimes when when we're speaking and i will say like man like if you do this it seems like you're only missing three days, but you're going to come back, and the other boys haven't missed it, and so they're at that load, you know, whatever, you know, yeah. load X, and you're coming in not at the same load. You haven't missed, like, the routine's been missed, and that's that's when I've noticed, like, the the biggest risk of injuries, like, when you're coming back straight into trying, like, because regardless, so you've missed a few days, you missed a week or whatever, and then you, you come back to training, and that's when your, your your loads are all off. The other guys are on a different kind of level. And we got a we got a small, close knit group that everyone sort of trains well and they look after each other. But man, if you you know, like it's still hard to to monitor that. That that's 
that's where I think the value is in keeping that consi- consistency. Yeah, well, that, that's the biggest challenge that I see with with um, you know some players in, in in our game. You know, just the consistency and and the analogy I use with the players or the metaphor that I use with the players is if you think about your kitchen at home, if you sweep it on a Monday morning, and then the next time you sweep it is on a Friday, it's going to be pretty dirty, isn't it? Okay, but one way of keeping it clean is to sweep the floor every single day. So when our players come in here, the, ch- the challenge is they've got to sweep the floor every day. If they if they train really well on a Monday and then the next time they train really well and put in effort and, and you know work really hard as the Friday, well, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, the, the floor is dirty. You know? So they're not going to be as well prepared. They're not going to be um, as consistent with their output when it transfers to game day because of because of that during the week. I'm a big believer in what you do at training transfers to game day. And so, as I said, that the analogy or the metaphor that I use with the players is you've got to sweep the floor every single day, you know. And I, I would imagine, Rob, that that's that, that's you guys, you know. Every day you've got to be consistent. And you do, what, a couple of sessions every day? Yeah, yeah. So uh, we do plenty of, like, like a nine to five. Like, we just we yeah. do all our sessions during the day. And it's just, just like, just marginal gains. Every day just get a little bit better, a little bit better. Make sure you, you, you go to the session and you just, you put in the work, you go home, you do it again. And there's, it's... It's not rocket science. It's just you just got to do it. You know? It's the same with um, we talked about recovery earlier. Um, gaming's becoming really big. Like these I was days. about to bring it up. Yeah. Well, uh, what, what I find interesting is I try to educate the players on the fact that the training is just the stimulus. You don't get better. You know, you, I understand you, you learn different players and the rest, and you feel like you've got better. But the adaptation that occurs that allows you to physically develop that happens when you're in rest and digest mode, like we spoke about earlier. And you can only get into rest and digest mode when you switch off, when you're in relaxation. Yeah, and you can't be in relaxation when, when you're gaming. Yeah. So, again, I, I've, I've encountered um, environments and players and we're, we're trying to educate the players appropriately in this area that it, it's no good jumping in the ice bath for six minutes and freezing your balls off and feeling like you've, you've recovered. If you, then you go and even you eat the right meal, so you've ticked one box, you've hydrated, you've ticked two boxes, but then you stay up till two o'clock playing Fortnite and... <laughs> and you get up at six the next morning to train, you rip in and you train hard again, but you can't get that adaptation because you're not allowing your body to rest and digest. The, the other thing is like, the, like the, the, the parts of your brain that are being stimulated when you're playing a video game are not the same as if you're even reading a book. No. Like the, the, the way your, your brain is being stimulated, so you're not resting at all. So like say if you went home and you spent two to three hours, I don't know, even having a conversation, you relax, your heart rate drops, you read a book and you're getting ready for bed so you're winding down it's completely different to the stimulus that's occurring in your brain if you spent three hours playing video games it's, it's absolutely and and you that's ex- fundamentally rest and digest mode yeah is you feel relaxed your heart rate variability changes and your your parasympathetic dominance takes over where your body is now healing itself the, the, talking about science again is um i had some exposure in, in business world to the gaming side of business and they've got some very 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 smart brain research scientists looking at ways of creating addictiveness yeah and and dopamine as well like the dopamine how how can we get these guys at the right time in games they're reading all sorts about the players interactions with the game to be able to provide the stimulus that hooks them and keeps them in keeps them in colors the sounds everything yeah everything is 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 researched it's not published peer-reviewed research but it's researched the the, the revenues for these gaming companies you think about it's it crazy. fundamentally depend on it's like a casino a, a when you go to a casino and all everything and it looks yes. like it's the same time temperature gives you a little win so you stay involved yeah. and it's way worse it's, Is it's, it? yeah. it's way worse because yeah. yeah. I don't feel bad afterwards <laughs> <laughs> yeah. there you go yeah and, and um, it's going to be interesting how it develops over the, oh, the immediate yeah. the, 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 the near future because you know I, even at my age I'm, I'm just 38 i feel so far removed from that world because i never lived that yeah me, you know, me neither, yeah. I, I never lived that world so i'm the same age i get it but i don't i don't truly understand it that was one of the that was one of the key things i had to change like when um when i started hitting the the, the training consistently and then i needed that recovery and, and and whatnot is that um i i i grew up on video games like i i am that's yeah, that's my passion. The gamer. <laughs> that's what I do. But um, I, I used to, I used to play all through the night, literally until 
I just jumped in the bed and went to sleep and then I'd be sitting there with my mind racing, thinking about different things until four in the morning or something, you know. It's, um, and then, like, same thing in between sessions. Like, I'd hit the session hard, then I'd go home, have something to eat and just play until the next one. And then I was wondering why I was tired. Go <laughs> to the next one. Yeah. mentally exhausted, you know. So one of the, one of the thing, key things I had to implement was, like, before bed, I can't play games. So I have to, like, read a book in bed and just do that before I go to sleep so yeah. that my, my mind isn't so fast. Yeah. It's, it's not firing along. And then between sessions, if, I, if I'm given the time, I make sure I have to sleep. Like I force myself to go to bed and just lay there and try and sleep because I want to go play games, but I, <laughs> but I, but I know that if I do, then I'm just going to be tired, yeah. or like mentally tired, yeah. which is so much worse. Yeah, I know we've had um, our sports psychologist is a, is a lady by, by the name of Galen Clues, who is an outstanding uh, sports psychologist. She's worked with numerous um, you know, successful teams, but she actually spoke to our players about that, just the, the, um, you know, the issue of you know, playing games before bed. Um, your mind's racing, you know, the, the amount of dopamine hits that you've actually had, um, it's really hard to then relax. And uh, and sometimes you know the players will play it until one or two in the morning or whatever, and uh, if they've got a big game the following night, you think about how fatigued, you know, potentially not having sl- a good sleep the night before the game. If you've done all your prep during the week and then because you're addicted to the game the night before the game, it's going to have an impact on your performance the next day. And like, it's it's counterproductive because what you need to be able to access your your flight or fight, which is what you're going to do when you fight or play a, a rugby league game. Like you need your neural system has to have recovered, mm-hmm. but if you've been uh, stimulating your flight or flight uh, system and like the night before, the morning of, the week before, like it's going to have an effect when you've been able to access that on on fight night. Chemically, or, you're spot yeah. on. It's adrenaline, isn't it? If you're constantly, we we're supp- uh, Galen talks about this really well. We're supposed to be exposed to short burst adrenaline, you know, like w- when we're being attacked, when we're about to have a fight. That's when you get that. Poof, that hit of adrenaline but if you're getting that when you're gaming <laughs> and you've got your headset on and you're so engaged in the game and you're constantly getting that hit of adrenaline like anything you adapt to that and it becomes less effective but also when, you, when you've got adrenaline flowing through your system you think about like where we've evolved from as humans you you, you can't recover no it's everything else shuts down opposite. your digestive system shuts down everything Absolutely. shuts down yeah. and you can't recover you know the other side to it is there's some really strong research around there being a limit to willpower. So thinking about making good decisions around nutrition, um, making good decisions. The, there's a, the research would show that there's, there's a limit on how much we can do that each day, and that makes sense to us intuitively, 100%. that it's, it's hard to eat well all the time. You know, we talk to players about, well, get it right 80% of the time, you're gonna be okay. Also, it's underestimated how much of an impact that has on another side to gaming, I'm slamming gaming, is, is the amount of decisions that they have to make in that and, and the thinking around it, when they're doing that, that's, that's one, making sure their brain switched on in the wrong areas at the wrong times for us, but also it has a carryover effect into their ability to make good decisions nutritionally around the choices they make in life, but also when it comes to training, there's a, there's a willpower and decision fatigue, which is the absolute last thing we want, and the whole reason why we put in so many routines and rituals is to take away that um, requirement for yeah. the player to make decisions about simple things like what time is training what's well, consistent what does training look like on this day well it's consistent you know what's going to happen there we're putting those routines and rituals in to allow them to have the willpower if you like and the decision making buffer to make good decisions on a 3v2 in football football training when, when it counts but sometimes wasting that with your with your gaming you know and even even like if you are playing video games you're not even stopping to eat properly because you're not, you're not, your your body's in a in a state of angst, and you're trying to put food in, and your body's like, fuck, we're not digesting because your body doesn't know the difference. Your body's like, no, we're about to be attacked by wolves and bears, so we're not digesting this properly. We're eating this, like you're in the Hunger Games or something, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, gentlemen, we've actually run out of time. That's Mr. Great. Matt Lodge is here. Thank you so much for your time. Really, no, really, thank really you appreciate. Guys. No, it's, it's, thank, you. thank you for having us. Hey, no, no, it's our, it, honestly, it's our pleasure. We we. Um, we get more out of having you guys here for, for um, the three or four days than, um, than the other way. Highly um, doubt so that, mate. Highly well, we doubt do. that. We certainly do. Thanks, yeah. guys. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot.